Gethsemane. Along with his disciples, the Savior slowly made his way to the Garden of Gethsemane. The Passover moon, bright and full, shone from a cloudless sky. The city of pilgrim tents was hushed in silence. Jesus was earnestly talking with his disciples, instructing them. But as they neared Gethsemane, he became strangely silent. Jesus frequently came here for prayer and meditation, but never with a heart so full of sorrow as on this night of his last agony. During his life on earth, he had walked in his Father's presence. When in conflict with men who were inspired by the very spirit of Satan, he could say, He that has sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone, because I always do the things that pleases him. But now, he seemed to be excluded from the sustaining light of his Father's presence. Now he was numbered with the transgressors. The guilt of fallen humanity he must bear, and upon him who knew no sin must be laid the iniquities of us all. How terrible does sin appear to him! So great is the weight of guilt that he must bear, that he is tempted to fear that it will forever shut him out from his Father's love. Feeling the full magnitude of God's wrath against transgression, he exclaims, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even unto death. Never had his disciples seen him so completely sad and silent, and as they proceed, this strange silence deepens. But they dared not ask him why. His body swayed as if he was about to fall. Every step he now took, was with painstaking effort. He groaned aloud as if suffering under the weight of a terrible load. Near the entrance of the garden, he left all but three of his disciples, urging them to pray for him and for themselves. Along with Peter, James, and John, he went a little farther into the garden. These three disciples were his closest companions they beheld his glory on the Mount of Transfiguration. They saw Moses and Elijah talking with him. They heard the voice from heaven. Now, in his great struggle, Jesus desired their presence near him. Yet, he could not bear that even they should witness the agony he is about to endure. And he said to them, Stay here and watch with me. He went a little farther from them and fell prostrate upon the ground. Sin was now separating him from his father. The gulf was so broad, so black, so deep that his spirit trembled before it. From this agony, he must not use divine power to escape. As a man, he must suffer the consequence of man's sin. As a man, he must endure the wrath of God against transgression. His suffering could best be described in the words of the prophet Zechariah who said, Awake, O sword against my shepherd, against the man who is close to me, declares the Lord Almighty. As a substitute for sinful man, he is suffering under divine justice. He feels what justice is. He, who had always been an intercessor for others, now longs to have an intercessor for himself. In the wilderness of temptation, the destiny of humanity had been at stake. Christ was then the conqueror, but now the tempter had come back for the last fearful struggle. Everything was at stake for him. If he failed here, the kingdoms of this world would finally become Christ. He would be overthrown and cast out. But if Satan could win this one, the earth would be his dominion, Christ would be identified with Satan's kingdom, and would never more be one with God. Think of Jesus contemplating the price to be paid for the human soul. 
In his agony, he clings to the cold ground as if to prevent himself from being drawn farther apart from God. The chilling dew of night falls upon his prostrate form, but he pays it no attention. God's wrath against sin seems to be crushing the life out of him, and from his pale lip comes the bitter cry, O oh my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass away from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Rising with great effort, he staggered back to the place where he left his companions, but he found them asleep. To the very depth of his being, his human heart longed for sympathy in suffering. In the supreme agony of his soul, he came to his disciples with a yearning desire to hear some words of comfort from the ones that he had so often blessed and comforted in sorrow and distress. He who always had words of sympathy for them was now suffering superhuman agony and he longed to know that they were praying for him and for themselves. How hopeless appeared to be human ingratitude and guilt. Terrible was the temptation to leave the human race to bear the consequence of its own guilt while he stood innocent before God. But the weakness of his disciples awakened the sympathy of Jesus. He was afraid that they would not be able to endure the test that would come upon them in the hour of his betrayal and death. He did not rebuke them but said, Watch and pray so that you do not fall into temptation. Even in his great agony, he tried to justify their weakness. And he added, The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, Jesus is seized with superhuman anguish. Weak and trembling, he stumbled back to the place of his first agony. Now his suffering was even greater than before. As the affliction of the soul came upon him, his sweat was like great drops of blood falling to the ground. The cypress and the palm tree were the silent witnesses of his misery. From their leafy branches dropped heavy dew upon his tortured form, as if nature wept for its author, wrestling alone with the powers of darkness. A few moments earlier, Jesus stood like a mighty cedar withstanding the storm of opposition that exhausted its fury against him. Stubborn wills and hearts filled with malice and deceit tried in vain to confuse and overpower him. He stood forth in divine majesty as the Son of God. But now he is like a tree bent and beaten by an angry storm. He had approached the consummation of his work as a conqueror. Having gained the victory over the powers of darkness at every step of the way. As one already glorified, he had claimed oneness with God. In unfaltering tones, he had raised his songs of praise. He had spoken to his disciples with words of tenderness and compassion. But now had come the hour of the power of darkness. Now his voice was heard on the still evening air not in tones of triumph, but filled with human woe. Father, if this cup cannot pass from me except I drink it, thy will be done. Again, Jesus came to his disciples, but they were still sleeping. Again, he felt the longing for companionship, for some words which could bring relief and break the spell of darkness that almost overpowers him. His presence awakened them, but their eyes were heavy. They did not know what to say to him. They saw his face stained with the bloody sweat of agony, and they were filled with fear. His anguish of mind they could not understand. His visage was so marred beyond that of any man, and his form more than the sons of men. Turning away, the humanity of the Son of God trembled in that trying hour. He did not pray then for his disciples that their faith will not fail, but for his own tempted and agonized soul. The awful moment had come. 
the moment that was to decide the destiny of the world. The fate of humanity trembled in the balance. Christ could even now refuse to drink the bitter cup measured out to guilty man. It was not yet too late. He could wipe the bloody sweat from his brow and leave man to perish in his sin. He could say, let the transgressor receive the penalty of his iniquity and I will go back to my father. Will the Son of God drink the bitter cup of humiliation and agony? Will the innocent suffer the consequence of the curse of sin to save the guilty? The words fell from the trembling lips of Jesus. O oh, my Father, if this cup may not pass away from me except I drink it, thy will be done. Three times he uttered that prayer. Three times his humanity sprung from the last crowning sacrifice. Now the history of humanity comes up before the world's Redeemer. He says that the transgressors of the law, if left to themselves, will perish. He sees the helplessness of men. He sees the power of sin. The woes and lamentations of a doomed world rises before him. He beholds his impending fate and his decision is made. He will save man at any cost to himself. He accepts the baptism of blood that through him perishing millions may gain everlasting life. He has left the course of heaven where all is purity, happiness and joy to save the last sheep. The one world that has fallen by transgression and he will not turn away from his mission. He will become the redeemer of a race that has willed to sin. Having made his decision, he fell to the ground from which he had partially risen. Where now were his disciples to place their hands tenderly beneath the head of their fainting master and bade that brow marred indeed more than the sons of men? But the Savior trod the wine press alone, and of the people there were none with him. Looking sorrowful upon his disciples, he said, Sleep on now, and take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners.